iniciaremos neste momento o painel Oportunidades e Desafios para a Sustentabilidade Empresarial em Países Emergentes. Chamamos ao palco para mediar este painel o jornalista William Wack. E convidamos os conferencistas Gro Harlem Brundtland, ex-primeira-ministra da Noruega e coordenadora do relatório Nosso Futuro Comum, relatório Brundtland. Jenny Roderick, economista e professor da Universidade de Harvard. A ministra de Estado de Meio Ambiente, Isabela Teixeira. É, eu, eu sempre fico grato de poder ver as pessoas com as quais eu estou falando. E não resisto à minha piada favorita, e como vocês sabem, não estou acostumado a dizer bom dia às pessoas, só boa noite, e eu, às vezes... Temo, quando as pessoas me veem, que elas acham que seja já hora de dormir. Não é o caso. É, just putting the same joke in English, I'm a host of a late news night evening newscast, so when people watch me, they think it's time to go to bed. So it's just a great opportunity to see you guys all. É, nós vamos começar rápido a trabalhar, é o tema provavelmente central, não só desse dia de trabalho aqui, mas da própria conferência, do nosso ponto de vista, do nosso ponto de vista, eu acho que está muito bem formulado nesse sentido, do ponto de vista dos países emergentes, o Brasil é um dos principais países emergentes, o que toda essa discussão significa para nós, para o nosso crescimento, para a nossa prosperidade, para o nosso desenvolvimento. O que nós combinamos é que cada um dos participantes terá 10 minutos para fazer é, é, suas, suas é, colocações iniciais, e depois a minha tarefa é fazê-los dialogar entre si. Pelo, pelo que foi combinado, a, a primeiro-ministro Gro vai, eu combinei com ela que vou chamá-la pelo primeiro nome, por isso não se assustem. Ela vai falar dez minutos, depois teremos nossa ministra Isabela falando por dez minutos, e depois o Denning mais dez minutos. Então, eu vou pedir, por favor, Gro, it's up to you. Interesting uh, session before us here. Um, so we are cutting down our remarks, but I hope the main points will be, um, you know, enough to enter into the round table after. So today, uh, as we approach Rio Plus 20, I want to start going back 40 years and think about the first global conference on the environment. Why? In Stockholm, 1972. At already then, we knew that there was an enormous challenge the world was facing. The risk of permanent damage to our environment and to our only one Earth. The conference back then was seen by developing countries to be one that focused on luxury problems of the rich countries and overlooking vast poverty and lack of development in large parts of the world. Today, 40 years later, the same dimensions in this debate are still with us. As global leaders address the crucial issues that are involved and struggle to agree on a path ahead that is realistic, just, and equitable. The, um, you know, we urgently now need to step up the pace of change because we will all benefit from the many large and small decisions that, for instance, are taken by businesses and companies who look beyond the short-term perspective, as we just saw on the screen, as they choose investments and solutions for the future. These are the actors and innovators that we will see succeed. And these will prove to be the heroes of the younger generations. Today, I am convinced even more than 25 and 20 years ago that we need to even more fundamentally grasp the key role of women in our societies, in our economies. 
countries and companies with higher levels of gender equality do have faster growth and better performance. I don't know if you are aware, but this is a fact. As economies are teetering, ecosystems under siege, and inequality within and between countries is soaring. We need to realize that these are symptoms that share a root cause, where short-sighted and often narrow interests have superseded common interests, common responsibilities, and plain common sense. In 2000, the world leaders made a promise to half the number of people living in poverty by 2015. Today we are uh, on track to meet that target. On the environmental front, we tackle the problems of ozone depletion and reduce the prevalence of many heavy metals and other toxic substances. Um, and also, air and water grew cleaner in many countries, even as industrial output continued to grow. This is a reminder to all of us that we are able to promote real change. Global commitments do matter. The work of committed institutions and individuals do make a difference. But the statistics, of course, also play uh, show us a much gloomier picture. We have made progress on poverty, but most of that progress occurred in China and India. Sub-Saharan Africa still lags behind. Much more is needed also on this Latin American continent. In the developing world, nearly 25% of children under five are underweight. In many parts of the world, women still suffer from discrimination and lack basic rights, including the right to own the land they farm. Globally, 1.3 billion people still lack access to basic energy services. And it is hard to believe that one decade into the 21st century, exposure to indoor air pollution from the use of wood, dung, and coal for cooking and home heating is still one of the world's biggest public health problems. In the global economy, meanwhile, our appetite for fossil fuels is undiminished, even as the early warning signs of a warming planet continue to multiply. In short, most of the unsustainable trends that my colleagues and I identified and warned about back in 1987 continue. In some cases, they are even accelerating. The UN Secretary General has made sustainable development a key aspect of his second term. His high-level panel on global sustainability, on which I had the honor to serve with your minister, Isabella Texera, and I'm looking forward to our discussion later, uh, delivered our report early this year. And we made clear that the current global problems are still, and the model of development, still unsustainable. We can no longer assume that our collective actions will not trigger tipping points, as environmental thresholds are breached, risking irreversible damage to both ecosystems and to human communities. So we all need to realize that the drivers of that challenge include unsustainable lifestyles, production and consumption patterns, and the impact of population growth. As the global population grows from seven to nine billion by 2040, with the emergence of three billion new middle-class consumers over the next 20 years, the demand for resources will rise exponentially. By 2030, we will need at least 50% more food, 45% more energy, and 30% more water. And all that at a time when environmental thresholds are throwing up limits, new limits to supply. So the panel concluded 
that we need to measure and to price what really matters. The marketplace must reflect the full ecological and human costs of economic decisions. It must establish price signals that make transparent the consequences both of action and of inaction. Pollution, including carbon emissions, can no longer be free. Subsidies should be made transparent and phased out for fossil fuels by 2020. We must now build new ways to measure GDP. Efficient use of resources saves money for businesses and households. Valuing and creating markets for natural capital can provide new economic opportunities. A green economy will be a source of future employment and of innovation. And of course, limited public funds must be used strategically to unlock greater private investment flows, to share risks and expand access to the building blocks of prosperity, including modern energy services. And governments, as you are aware, are now discussing what we have suggested, uh, universally applicable sustainable development goals that can galvanize, galvanize long-term action beyond the electoral cycles. And as I mentioned, we certainly must invest in women. Half of humankind's collective intelligence and capacity is a resource we can no longer afford to lose out on. We must now stop all discrimination against girls and women, and by instead empowering women, we will unleash the largest untapped potential for sustainable development. I believe the next increment of global growth could come from the full economic empowerment of women. Access to energy is crucial to all, rich and poor. Still a large fraction of the world's population have energy insecurity. What does it mean? Inability to read at night, to travel to a job, to keep life-saving vaccines refrigerated. And we know the crucial role of energy in any society. The global potential for improving energy efficiency is enormous. Remember, the US has half the energy efficiency of Japan and China has only one ninth so far. Active renewable energy markets are emerging, not only in the large economies of China, India, and here in Brazil, which have each made substantial renewable commitments, but also in countries through the Middle East and Africa. But the BRICS combined share of global GDP, GDP as it has increased from 23 to 32% over the last 60 years, mostly through the increased use of fossil fuels and the unsustainable exploitation of natural resources, such as oceans and forests, mean that should development continue along this path, it would jeopardize future growth and put at risk the great advances you have already made in health, literacy, and income. Each year, private companies invest approximately $5 trillion in energy infrastructure projects. And realigning even a small share of this, about 2%, would go a long way towards realizing a sustainable energy vision as the one that the Secretary General has proposed for this meeting. But we all know, I think, that business, investors, activists, and scientists cannot alone change the way we produce and use energy or other basic resources. They can anticipate change, they can facilitate it, profit from it, but they cannot drive it. Public policies are indeed needed to stimulate markets, remove barriers, and level the playing field. In fact, annual subsidies for established fossil fuels are estimated to cost between 350 and $500 billion worldwide, depending on the oil price. 
And these are resources that could be channeled to clean, low-cost, sustainable energy technologies while combining subsidy reform with social protection programs. So it would be easy but profoundly mistaken to suppose that addressing the problems of poverty, ecosystem degradation, and climate change is a luxury we can't afford or an agenda that we will have to put off for another day. It's too late to even think in those terms. The same failures of governance that have produced political and economic upheaval around the world in recent years are, I believe, also behind our inability so far to set an environmentally sustainable and socially equitable course for our common future. So worldwide, uh, meanwhile, a growing pool of capital is sitting idle, unable to find adequate returns, while unemployment source and social inequities are a great problem. So business now needs and calls for much more government action to inspire innovation and the solutions to reach a sustainable world. And finally, when we look 20 years down the line, or even today, partnerships will be crucial. The traditional separation between the public and the private sector increasingly will be looking irrelevant as our societies realize how interdependent we all are in a world with mounting common challenges and threats. Not just the public and the voluntary sectors, but also the business community will be socially and globally responsible. I believe a greater sense of shared responsibility is essential to prepare for a future that is safer, more prosperous, and more secure. Thank you very much.